being here. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Trinidad Rico. She is an assistant professor and director of the Cultural Heritage and Preservation Studies program at Rutgers University. She's an honorary senior lecturer at the Institute of Archaeology at University College London. Um, previously, she held appointments at University College London at Qatar and at Texas A&M University at Qatar. She received her BA in Archaeology and Anthropology from the University of Cambridge. She has an MA in Principles of Conservation from the University College London and an MA and PhD in Anthropology from Stanford University. A specialist in critical heritage, she has carried out research in Indonesia, the Arabian Peninsula, and today we'll hear about her new research project on heritage and secrecy in Argentina, which is supported by the Arts and Humanities Research Council Global Challenges Research Fund, UCL's Global Engagement Strategy Leadership Fund, and Universidad de los Laos, um, Chile. She's the author of Constructing Destruction, Heritage Narratives in the Tsunami City, which was published by Rutledge in 2016. She's also the editor of The Making of Islamic Heritage and co-editor of the volumes Heritage Keywords, Rhetoric and Redescription in Cultural Heritage, and Cultural Heritage in the Arabian Peninsula, Debates, Discourses, and Practices. In addition to her books, she has had articles published in a wide range of journals, including the journal Socio so, excuse me, Social Archaeology, Material Religion, Conservation and Management of Archaeological Sites, World Archaeology, Culture, Agriculture, Food and Environment, and Future Interior. Today, her talk is titled Heritage, Secrecy, and Failure, the Atomic Project Humul. Um, so please join me in welcoming Trinidad Rico. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I wasn't sick until I got on the train, obviously, <laughs> and now I'm coughing a little bit. I'm sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, Alicia, for inviting me. Um, it's been really exciting to move back to the U.S., after a long absence and already be liaising with so many of um, your colleagues here. So it's been really great to come down to the big city to, to do this. When you read my bio and when I talk to people, I get a lot of questions about what exactly I specialize on. So because it seems like a really rude question to ask me, I'm going to preemptively anticipate this and <laughs> explain that um, my work, even in anthropology, has always been focused on how preservation can be studied as a set of practices, not, not as heritage, as a constructed entity, but something that we can study ethnographically um, and as a behavior, as a set of values that gets deployed for something. And due to the nature of those interests, I've always found it quite interesting to look at the non-Western world. So my PhD was in Indonesia looking at post-tsunami recovery and how in the face of total destruction, we can look at construction of new things that get bestowed heritage value and get not just heritage value discursively, but they get treated as if they are a precious resource to preserve and you can study over time the way preservation is deployed on them. Um, and then for the last five years, I've been working in Qatar, mostly in Doha, but also in the inland, inland parts of Qatar. There's, a, there's a lot more than Doha and Qatar, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've been looking at how preservation is deployed alongside Islamic values, quote unquote. Um, some of you might know, Abigail, you definitely know, that there isn't a lot of literature in heritage studies about preservation in the context of Islam beyond um, the focus on destruction. So I've been working on an interdisciplinary project that looks at how um, we, can, we can look at preservation attitudes and practices in, as, as something that is outside of the realm of heritage with a capital H. This brings me to this project, which is a little bit weird. It's a little pilot project I've been running for a few summers. Um, and this is what happens when you get funding that has no strings attached, and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> and then you think, oh, I'll just look at this really theoretical type of project um, on something that could be heritage, but it's not heritage. And what do we do when something has, um, has been constructed through secrecy and censorship? And at what points and how does that get enabled to become a heritage subject and how does it fail, right? So um, that's the kind of topic I'm dealing with today. Sorry, I'm doing two things at the same time. There, multitasking. OK, so this is where my project lies. It's on the southern third half of Argentina in this region called Patagonia that some of you may have heard of. It's a very romanticized um, natural heritage type of area. There's a whole bunch of national parks. It's very sparsely populated. There's less than one 
person per square kilometer. It's very green, full of sheep. It's amazing. Um, and this lake, there's a whole series of, of lake networks all around the Andes here on the border with Chile. And then there's, there's this really big lake. It's not the biggest lake by any means, but it's a big lake, um, very close to the border with Chile. And there's an island in the middle of the lake called Wemul. And I realize it's not the best word to pronounce in English, but I should have given you the heads up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's Wemul Island. I do want to note, because this will come up again, that this is in a town. It's not remote in the sense that there's no people around it. There's a town there called Bariloche. And the town is all around the lake, right? So it's a kind of little, um, it's kind of a spread, it's a town spread around a lake because most of the area around this national park is intangible, so you can't actually build on it. Um, so it, it's something that I, I want us to talk about later a little bit because what you have here is you have a collision of concerns with natural heritage preservation and cultural heritage concerns as well if you want to bring them on the mix, in the mix. Um, but yeah, so the distance between actual populated coastlands and the island is nothing. It's probably less than a kilometer. So I will be talking about this remote island, but I want to point out that it's remote, but it's, you can see it from the coastline. You can possibly swim it if you were really strong, and the, if this wasn't a glacier lake and you died in 10 minutes, but you can definitely kayak it. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's, this is some, some of the discussions we can have is about remoteness, right? So this is the island. It doesn't look like much. I want to say maybe it's three kilometers by two kilometers, and that would be rounding up. Uh, and there isn't much to it except that it has this. So this is an aerial photograph of the island that was taken quite recently, I think. Um, and this is the uh, survey that we've been carrying out on the, on, the re on the archaeological. It's a very generous term to call it archaeological. On the ruins of the island that has been abandoned since. Because it is an intangible area, generally, anything surrounding the lake, there hasn't been a lot of activity on this island. So we do have a very distinct period of occupation, as if you had an occupation of an archaeological site, except that this only, <coughs> excuse me, lasted three years. So it's a bit of an, of an oddball in terms of archaeological site stratigraphy. So what happened in this island, and the reason why I'm showing you these ruins, is that in the early 1950s, the island became a repository for a secret quote unquote nuclear facility. And I use quotes in this because it's not really clear whether this was ever active. All scientific um, analysis of what happened in this island point out to the fact that there was never any kind of scientific research really carried out, or at least not the type of scientific research that would denominate this as a nuclear facility. But that's how it called itself. That's how the project called itself. So because of the timing in post Second World War, beginnings of Cold War, because of the type of government Argentina was having, because of the relatively remote location of this island that's not inhabited, um, we know very little about this, about this enormous array of structures. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about why we don't know about it, and then we can move on to talking about issues of what this is in terms of heritage and preservation. In 1948, Argentina um, became really enamored with the idea of bringing in foreign scientists, just pretty much like the US was doing. The US went on and grabbed all the really cool scientists. Argentina grabbed whatever was left. The guy on the left is Ronald Richter. He is an Austrian physicist that was invited by the president of Argentina at the time, Juan Domingo Perón, invited to <coughs> present a project, like some kind of cutting edge project that would put Argentina on the map in terms of technological powerhouses, right? So Argentina was in an economic position in which it could join uh, some kind of race for technological supremacy at the time. It actually came out quite well off after the two world wars. And it was quite a rich country, so it could pour a lot of money into um, high, te high level technology at the time. So um, he, it's a complicated history, but the reason why these two guys are on this photo together is because they did spend a lot of time together, and Ronald Richter promised to the president of Argentina that he could actually bring in the technology to create nuclear fusion, right, which is something still today quite experimental. And he convinced the president and his cabinet that he could bring this type of technology in if only he was given infinite resources. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know this doesn't make my country look very good at all. Um, so he does, he did get infinite resources and really genuinely infinite, like uh, millions of dollars of today's dollars. And 
alongside the promise for unlimited power, which was very, a very sexy proposition for a socialist country at the time, the idea of having the kind of power that you can just share with everyone. Um, and I did put my flag there because a lot of the metaphors when talking about this project in what I assume was half broken English and German and a translator, Richter kept pointing at, in the conversations we do have documented, at the sun in the middle of the Argentine flag and saying, like the sun in your flag, I can bring you nuclear fusion that you can you know, then make, share for this country. And the whole project was always promised um, under the flag of, of of uh, a, a peace-oriented nuclear development. So there was a really big rhetoric from the side of the government at the time that this was not going to be used for any kind of military purposes, but it was going to be used for peace um, or, or, or projects that didn't interfere with uh, a peaceful world. Which is quite interesting because a few years later, the Atoms for Peace initiative um, takes hold in the world where there's, there's a whole commitment, <coughs> not full commitment, quote unquote commitment from the world to and stop using nuclear energy for, um, for the purposes of war. Now, he requested as part of this project absolute secrecy, right? So he requested not just infinite resources, but the ability to keep his project under complete wraps until it was fully deployed, right? I'm not really sure, and no one is really sure about what he promised in terms of um, his expertise in order to conduct this, but it seems to have worked. So. This is how the, our project began. He got given, it, it had a different location before, then there's this whole myth of origins where he flew around this beautiful Switzerland-like landscape in an airplane, and then he pointed at this island and said, that's where I want my lab, it's remote, it has access to fresh water, this is where I want to build my stuff. And I want you to note the monumentality of these structures, considering that this project was only um, active in active process of construction for just three years. There's quite a lot of stuff that was built in that period of time, so it was quite a manic building pace where he recruited the army so that they could be in it in the secrecy together, and they were, um, they were you can see the town of Bariloche just across, or oh, it's a residential neighborhood, but it, it wasn't as populated then, but this is the main road around the lake, so there was something that was clearly visible from the road, but it had reflectors. <coughs> he requested the National Guard to um, circle the island in boats, guarding it, and there were well, armed guards everywhere. So it had it had the whole um, performance of a secret place, and consequently, no no real citizens from the town were working on the island because they were bringing external consultants in order to preserve that difference and that um, distance between the project and the citizens around it. So in 1951. The scientist, the mad scientist Richter calls the president and says, I did it. I've achieved nuclear fusion at a theoretical level. I know a lot of you guys are looking at me like, it's part of the story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so the president went ahead and held a press conference and he said, in the atomic energy pilot plant on Wemul Island, which was clearly not that secret because you can hold a press conference and say that it's <laughs> happening there, thermonuclear experiments were carried out under conditions of control on a technical scale. Right, so very carefully worded. And then he went to the newspapers and he announced, we have the sun, which is quite the most fantastic front page of a newspaper ever created, right? Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to show you guys here is, this is the way the project looked when it was in active process of construction, although this is the third iteration of the quote unquote nuclear reactor. And this is the way it looks the other day, right? Mm -hmm. So due to the magnitude of this construction, the state of preservation is actually quite amazing considering it's an abandoned site that gets snowed in several, um, several months a year. But it doesn't actually have any development to compete with the ruins, right? So it doesn't have a lot of traffic, but it's also not controlled. People can go and they can poach whatever they want, but see how the scaffolding is still in place on a lot of the buildings, right? Which is it's quite incredible to see a site that was abandoned from one day to the next. Um, so, yeah, <coughs> almost immediately after this announcement and under pressure by some people that were a little bit suspicious about what was going on, uh, Argentina put together, the president put together a committee of nuclear physicists to come and take a look at the experiments, right? So some kind of an expert voice to, to, to look at it. Um, very essential in all of uh, Argentina's uh, committees at the time is a priest. 
obviously. So it has to be brought into everything at the time, probably still today. Um, and so this committee of physicists came over, and they are the only witnesses to the active period of the site. So these are the only people that came from the outside. The president did visit at some time, at some point, but these are the only scientists that could give us somewhat of an account of how the site was operated and the type of stuff that was in each lab, um, since we don't have any record of it. And they come in and they say, well, no, this is bogus. And they witness this type of experiment that he was claiming to ha demonstrate that he had achieved this nuclear fusion at a technical scale. And, he, uh, and they, they write a report. The priest said, no, this is legitimate. The physicists say, no, actually, this, um, the machine was unplugged, or this explosion relates to this other physical um, property. And they communicate to the president, and the project gets almost immediately shut down. right? <coughs> and this was the end of the project, and this is around 1953. And what happens after this is that we know very little let me go back to this. We know very little about w how this came to an end. It seems to have been really abrupt, but the only witnesses that we have of the project were these scientists and then a whole lot of workers that then got recalled back to the barracks. And um, what followed after this is a military coup that um, took down Perón's presidency, which systematically burned all the documents that had the name Peron in it and all the photographs related to the island. And the island has since remained in a little bit of a limbo in that it is still there. It's heavily politicized if you bring it up, otherwise it's just there. It's not uh, what some may want to call negative heritage. It's just, it's just nothing. It's just these ruins in an intangible area which are not truly mapped in the municipal map of the town and they're not really managed by anyone. And what we do have left from that period is <coughs> a handful of photographs. And I say a handful after three years and three postdoctoral researchers dedicated almost exclusively to going through each one of the archives and the secret archives of Argentina. Argentina likes to have secret archives. So. Um, and we've managed to recover less than 10 photographs. And these are the t this is the quality of the photographs that we have. We know photographs were taken, we just can't find them. Uh, and at some point, we're going to have to pull the plug and decide that there are, there's really no visual record to study the site in the way that it was intended to be built. The one artifact we do have is this book. So this is the one book which was just translated into English, but until the other day, it just existed in Spanish, which is a book written by uh, a, a contemporary nuclear physicist that did get hold of documentation, mostly letters, between the president and his right hand, which was assigned to oversee the construction of the island, or the president and the mad scientist. So we have very partial information about how decisions were being made, and a little bit on how the site was being constructed. And these are photos of the way the site was constructed. We can see here, well, these are barracks, and these are two main research labs. This is the nuclear reactor, quote unquote, nuclear reactor. In its second iteration, it went through being a concrete um, barrel to being demolished days later and then digging a 14 meter deep hole in the bedrock with dynamite. And then the scientist changing his mind and then covering that with rubble and, and, and concrete and then building the structure you can see today, that really big square. And that's essentially what gave it away as a bit of a complicated project, the fact that it was going through so many iterations. But this, is, this and another five photos is all we have. We have the photos of the scientists, we have the photos of this construction, uh, and we may or may not find anything. But this, this book tells this account from the perspective of the development of nuclear science in Argentina, and it doesn't explain at all how this project failed. And that's because the project is considered a failure. It's not considered the seed that was planted in order to start the technological history of Argentina on the nuclear side, but it's considered a project that just didn't go well, that puts the country to shame, um, that gets now mobilized as, uh, you probably know this, but Argentina goes through a very Peron, a favorable country to an anti-Peron country within you know cycles of four to eight years. So um, whenever you are, investigating this, you have literally a four-year window to look at it, because then the archives get closed, or then your project becomes politicized, or then you lose all your allies in the municipality. And I'm sure this is not rare for archaeological um, work in, um, or, or archival work in a lot of places in the world, but this is the first time I've had to deal with it. So 
again, we don't have a lot of photographs. We don't have the usual. What I want to point out is that the usual types of sources that we use to understand a site, to do interpretation, or to understand its as understand it as a problem of preservation of heritage value, we just can't rely on it. It just doesn't exist. The site did have a moment of five, 15 minutes of fame, which is just a few minutes of fame, a few months of fame, I think, um, when it became momentarily a tourist site. So the municipality at some point did think that this would be a really excellent tourist destination in what is already a very touristic area. So they did hire a company to create a lot of the signage um, and do a little bit of interpretation and build like a little bit of tourist infrastructure going through the forest. And these things remain now as a, a sort of archaeological relic, right? a, a kind of um, stratigraphic layer of historical archaeological value. But it didn't, it didn't really uh, advance beyond that. Unfortunately, there was quite a lot of quote unquote consolidation work that this um, group of people decided to do. So it destroyed um, um, a, a lot of the data that we could have accessed archaeologically, right? So they did demolition, so they, oh, they re, oh let's just rebuild this cantina uh, and call it a cantina, and they built it on top of the pre-existing ruins. So they did quite a lot of disturbance of the historic layer in a way that, um, that affects our ability to go in um, to the site as a, as a kind of historical archaeology site, if you can call it that, contemporary archaeology. So just to recap what we have, we have a site that's there, so there's a very distinct materiality of it in simultaneously an amazing state of preservation and a horrible state of preservation, right? Because it's, it's still standing. The labs are incredibly in, in a really good structural um, position. Um, but, but also there, uh, there's been quite a lot of damage, and I'll show you in a minute. And then we have no archival resources that which we traditionally used to understand its original state if we wanted to claim any kind of conversation on some level of authenticity or, or understand, create a management plan that strives to make it look like X. Uh, it was actively kind of glossed over with a touristy side that damaged the pre-existing conditions. And also what we don't have because of the extreme secrecy and censorship and pseudo paranoia that I'll talk about in a minute, we don't have a lot of oral history to relate to. So there isn't a lot of a, there, there aren't a lot of resources to, to conduct a project on the heritage value of this heritage, non-heritage site. <coughs> now what I wanted to point out with this site and the reason why I find it really sexy, and now you're like, oh, I read this book. Um, <laughs> is that I find this a really unique combination of challenges for anybody working on um, material culture and heritage value in that there's quite a lot of literature, well, I wouldn't say a lot, there's scattered literature on heritage methods um, that some of you may be now thinking, yes, that's true. Or, yeah, but from the perspective of heritage, there isn't quite a lot of discussion, well, there is some discussion on, on how, um, how methods get deployed, but they tend to make one key assumption, no matter what angle you're coming from. And the assumption is that if I deploy the right method, the right methodology, I can actually elicit a heritage value, right? So there's actually a foundational principle in the work of heritage and preservation that generally says, if the right conditions are given, then heritage value will manifest. Right? So it's always been a bit of a linear trajectory in the way that we think about it. And I'm thinking of all the work I've done in Heritage, not just this site. But what you get in this site is the inability to deploy any of the usual methodologies in order to capture some kind of heritage value or a conversation that helps us understand why there isn't heritage value. Right? So everything appears to be a dead end. And that's why my team and I became quite interested in this project. Um, from, from a methodological and theoretical perspective, just because we just don't seem to find the way of getting at this heritage value angle. And that's what we're hoping to be able to, to write about and contribute to the discipline. So, um, yeah, so what this value, what this heritage brings to, of value to the study of heritage and preservation is the idea of the invisible, and what do we do when something has been made invisible discursively, and how do we add, what do we do with that type of invisibility that would help us understand the way that heritage value operates, or how preservation is deployed, right? Why do we make assumptions that monumental things are actually, by their very nature, visible, right? Um, 
So the remains left in the island are not very useful for this particular methodological perspective. There are quite a lot of them, but there are one quite hard to interpret beyond the obvious. Oh, this is, the, we know this was used as a nuclear reactor or whatever. This was called the building that would hold a nuclear reactor. Therefore, it has, there are certain qualities to the building, like the, the walls are one meter deep, which is what's kind of prescribed, and one meter deep of cement in order to mitigate the effects of radiation. Um, but it's really hard to interpret beyond this purpose. It's just a structure. So in a way, it doesn't, it doesn't allow us to be looking at it in any other angle. And this is just um, the same, just to show there's several um, buildings of this scale around the island. This is one of the, what was called the twin labs, but it wasn't as completed as the crazy nuclear reactor. So, so they certainly are monumental, but they are almost non-existent in that sense. Just to show you a bit about the state of conservation, um, this is a picture of one, the only photo we have of the lab when it was in operation, that's uh, Ronald Richter. Um, this is the way the site looks now. You can probably tell two things from this. One, that it's been destroyed with mortar or something. There, there's, there's, been like a, there's been some kind of bomb dropped on the roof of this lab. We don't know much about it because after this we have um, 40 years of on and off military government and no records of what happened in this island. Um, but what did happen is a lot of these walls here that are more consolidated were walls and structures that were created during that extremely short period of tourism redevelopment. So in a way, it's been messed up with twice, right? So this would be the most interesting aspect of the island if you were to create some kind of scientific tourism, um, if you could sell that to my people. Um, and in addition, in addition to this, um, what we get is the, um, the, the afterlife of the island, which I think is quite interesting. This is another one of the labs. This was one of the chemical labs. And it's interesting. You can look at the walls and document the way that all of the pipes were being run through the walls because all of the copper piping was taken off. Everything was half looted later on, but in the beginning we think removed and reused because it was new scientific equipment. So we think it was technically, you know, physically reused to be built as a new scientific lab for the picture on the right, which is the Balsedo Institute of Nuclear Physics, which is just a few kilometers away from the island on the coastline of the lake. And it took root as a really um, prominent institution in which you can study nuclear physics and nuclear engineering and nuclear security now and it's been on a steady growth since the 60s. But the interesting thing about this is it was created by the same people whom you saw previously in a little circle discussing the validity of the nuclear physics experiment in the island. So in that sense, the island is not necessarily a failure. These are not ruins of a complete failure in that it planted that seed that initiated the development of um, nuclear research in Argentina, which is quite an important milestone. I mean, you can think of it as any other aspect of technological history in the history of humankind. Like, there's the beginning of something, and maybe it doesn't work out anymore, but, you know, people may not still be using, we were just talking about this before the mm -hmm. talk, um, may not still be using the same irrigation channels in the Arabian Peninsula. They kind of do use it. But <laughs> not the exact, the same irrigation channels are not being used. Now they've fallen into disuse, and they're archaeological objects but it's still a very important milestone in the development of technology that allows people to inhabit an area. So it's an interesting contrast to think of how we think of that as having archaeological value, right, an ancient Falash system, and then thinking of this as not having any type of value as a heritage subject in the sense of legacy, right? Heritage as a legacy, heritage as um, something that, demonst that, that, that shows progression towards something else, right? And in this sense, it's um, technological advancement. So we know that the labs were repurposed. We don't have any documentation on where all the stuff inside of this, which included um, equipment that was brought in through the black market from Europe. I mean, it, it, a significant investment in cutting edge equipment was done for the, for the, for the short lived time that this project was active. A lot of which I've been trying to trace in this institution now as a kind of weird ethnographic archaeological project where I'm tracing crumbs. And this is the way I conceptualize of the crumbs. What happens with this particular project is because the island in itself doesn't have a lot of value except for the visual um, and impressive shock value of the scale of this monumental site, 
we kind of have abandoned study on the island itself. And what we look at is we plotted a hypothetical trajectory of where all the little bits of the island went, which include where did the bricks go, the leftover bricks, what was built with the leftover bricks that were donated or stolen or relocated in some way to construct other structures. Um, where did, obviously we know the photographs are not really there yet. How did this impact, I should have translated this, but it was so pretty. Um, how, did, how did this site impact development of um, other nuclear physics projects around the world, which you can trace because it created quite a lot of rumor in which people in other labs were saying, well, obviously they can't do that, the Argentinians, but just in case, let's just create like a working group to look at this question, right? And you can trace the genealogy of ideas a little bit. And then the interesting bit that I've been focusing on is like looking at the number of objects and machinery that were repurposed ex situ and had a second life somewhere else, right? And this, um, it's a labor of love and of talking to physicists because there's no documentation on how this happens. So if I'm lucky, I walk into somebody's office and I find the keys of certain labs of Wemul Island that somebody's displaying there because they found it in a box one day and then it's just being displayed there. Um, but a lot of the, a lot of the um, older nuclear physicists in this institute have allowed me entrance into their labs, which is quite tricky because it's a nuclear physics lab, so you need a special permission. Um, and they've shown me <coughs> how different bits and pieces were plugged into new machinery, and then I try to understand what's going on, which is quite different because um, from any other type of visual analysis that we can do, mostly because everything looks really old in these labs. These, these are all aging labs. Um, and secondly, because I've, I've struggled to find a specialist in m early to mid-1950s technological nuclear development material culture, right? So we're kind of building the catalog as we go and then sitting down with nuclear physicists that may be aware of what machinery looked like at the time and then trying to get an idea of where in the island they used to belong to. And the purpose of this is not so much to create a, recreate the jigsaw puzzle, but to understand the processes through which these things get relocated as a, almost as a preservation problem, right? How do we reassemble a history where you have some of the pieces of the puzzle, but you don't actually know what the puzzle looked like, right? And it's, it's looking at it almost as a kind of spolia. It's things that were repurposed in other big things, um, without having preserved any of its history in the past. And the iconography of it is also lost in a way if nobody really knows where they come from. Now, I hate putting this slide up because then I wanna to talk to you about Hitler and Argentina, which is not a thing, um, but then people instantly cater all their questions to this. There's a huge issue in trying to access oral history to do with this site. Right, because an easy thing would be, well, let's just do like a really in-depth, multi-year oral history project of the town, because this wasn't that long ago, and a lot of the inhabitants are still there, people that heard, um, that witnessed massive um, cargo trucks uh, uh, unloading bricks from the end of the train line to take them into those rafts into the lake. So let's try, to, let's try to reconstruct some of what happened. The problem is, because of the conditions under which the island came to be, there's quite a lot of paranoia about to what degree the island reflects some kind of extension to the Third Reich, right? So Argentina, you may have heard, was a very interesting place to be after the Second World War, and there was an interesting harboring of um, a lot of SS soldiers in there. And there's a very active and very unsubstantiated rumor that Hitler did go to Argentina and that he died in Argentina, right? And this is the kind of thing that's, well, for one, very damaging <laughs> to um, Patagonia in general as a, as a place, but it doesn't seem to die off precisely because you get books like this sold at the airport uh, <laughs> as like a big bestseller, right? With a dubious um, academic backing. But what has happened since then, it wasn't that long ago, right? We're talking about 70 years of rumor. Is that this rumor has taken such a hold in the mentality of people in Argentina, in particular in Patagonia, that not only you get like Nazi tourism, whatever that is, like going and identifying places of Nazi action in the area, but also any time that there's any type of material culture of unclear 
um, integrity or dubious dimensions, it instantly gets called a Nazi bunker, right? And I just put here two examples of that. Now, the thing on the right is a, it's a, um, a water, a subterraneous water tank, which anybody would tell you, yeah, this is what like a 1950s subterranean water tank looks like. This is how you create a cistern and you like store water for the summer or whatever. Um, but for some reason, the fact that it's underground gets instantly tagged as a nuclear bunker. The thing on the left is a, used to be a hotel and then something happened with the family and then it, it got demolished because it would have been a risk, it's on a cliff, but it has been called a, a nuclear, uh, uh, a Nazi bunker for 70 years and it's really hard to convince people otherwise. So what I'm trying to say with this is people are not willing to talk about their experience or even that the rumors that they've heard about the island, right? Because it instantly gets caught up in this type of discourse and this type of narrative. So it's not as easy as saying, let's just put resources into capturing public perception over time of these ruins. Um, and, and studying rumor becomes quite interesting then because it's not, a type of, it's not a type of source that we're used to accessing. I think scientifically it's a little bit difficult to say, well, I've constructed this whole history of a place based entirely on rumor. Mm -hmm. And someone said, no, it's not rumor, it's all history. Rumor is a little bit more dubious because people, you have to coerce people into, into assuming that you're part of their circle in order to accept this rumor as truth. There has to be an element of buying in to the story so that you, you hear the story or that they take you to one of these ruins or that they show you the thing they took from the island that's in their living room, right? So it's, very, um, it's a very challenging ethnographic environment in that sense. But we've been trying to find in which ways rumor can help us at least create a bit of an indi indicative timeline of the island on things that we can't um, really capture. Like when, when did the soldiers practice target shooting on the structures? We can see the bullet holes in a lot of the structures, but we can't go and ask the Ministry of Defense, hey, when did you shoot this historic <laughs> resource, right? So, but then you, if you talk to somebody who did the military service there, they're really anxious about giving you inside information about that day that they went to test explosives. So everything becomes really tentative. Um, I've received hate mail, which is quite exciting. It's the first time I have a project mm -hmm. where I get hate mail um, about why are you uncovering this really difficult past in our country, the island, right? Distinguished from this. But, but to them, it's not distinguished. This is all really entangled in, in in this little town trying to be a legitimate place for a lot of things, right? Like a serious, it's a ski resort, a serious tourist destination. Um, it's a place where it has apparently the highest density of um, PhDs in the country because there's so many um, research institutes and everyone, and it happens to me that I go to conferences and I bump into people from my crappy little town, which is quite amazing. And it, there seems to be a culture of knowledge that is kind of overlaying this culture of like paranoia when it comes to its own landscape and a refusal to talk about it. <coughs> Another concern when it comes to addressing rumor, I have to explain all this, hang on. <laughs> yes, I know, I'm like, um, is that there is very serious anxieties about contamination. That has to do with the fact that there is an active research nuclear reactor on this, other nu <coughs> this new Nuclear Physics Institute that's there. It has to do with the nature of nuclear investigation in general, right? Quite a lot of anxiety about how exactly that, does it impact the environment. And we have a nuclear reactor inside of a national park, right, which causes all sorts of anxieties. Um, and how do I explain this in a way that sounds legitimate? So there's, in this lake, there's a relatively popular myth of a Loch Ness type of monster. Well, it happens with any glacier lake that's deep enough, I think. I don't have a theory on this, but I think it probably does. Um, so the lake is called Nahuel, uh, Nahuel Wapi. So obviously the Nahuelito is the little, our little Loch Ness, Loch Ness monster. And, um, and, and, our, and Patagonia is very active paleontologically anyway, so it, it helps tie certain completely loose ends to justify how in a very cartoon, cartoonish way previous or current contamination from nuclear facilities would have somehow led to a mutated 
type of creature. And that's kind of on the side, right? The contamination concerns are very active in general in terms of when everybody, anybody gets any kind of cancer diagnosis, there's, there's like a resurgence of the rumor that like it's probably in the water because the nuclear reactor's there, or it could have been something in the island. And just last month, the, um, um, the province voted against any future nuclear development in this island. So this heritage is in a really precarious position in that people think it's a historic resource. They see the value of bringing it up as a really unique site in the history of technological development. But at the same time, they're saying nuclear uh, development is really bad, right? It's kind of, it's on the realm of the immoral or irresponsible. And that's some of the tensions that we're dealing with here. So um, to wrap up a little bit, I just wanted to say that through this project we realized that not everything can be heritage. Again, it's not something that is a value that can just be uncovered. And I'm, I've trained in conservation before, so I know that we can enhance um, heritage value by doing investigative work. And that's what we think from a whole bunch of disciplines. Our disciplinary angle is we can, if we put enough work into something, we can really reveal the makings of it in terms of value. But some things we're noticing are, um, it's still not, perhaps it's not the time, it's too early, or it's never really going to um, be put in a context in which some kind of heritage value and preservation concerns can be articulated. And we look around the landscape in this research group that I'm part of, and the landscape of Patagonia in particular, which is so wild and full of natural beauty, and we see ruins everywhere that relate to um, a technological moment, right? So in particular, hydroele uh, hydroelectric uh, works in all the rivers of Patagonia, both on the Chilean and the Argentinian side, have left quite a lot of infrastructure. This is an abandoned um, uh, hydroelectric uh, village from the construction phase of uh, one of the plants. So what we're thinking is that there's a little bit of a methodological loophole when we think about how preservation is understood and operationalized if we are having issues defining what is an acceptable form of heritage construction, right? And what are the forces that are working against the construction of heritage value? And we're thinking this is a really exciting way of thinking of the absences we leave behind as a heritage and preservation discipline and how these absences can help us understand the way we construct the presence of value. And I'm, I'm gonna stop here and we can go to some questions and I need to give a shout out to all of my people as well. Thank you so much. somehow alerted to the possibility that this is a heritage site. So now I'm being called in to consult on how can we turn this into a heritage site? And I'm like, oh. But it was inevitable, right? Because the minute you throw in the H word, it just awakens all sorts of sentiments about how this fits into the broader narrative of like, oh, it's a ruin. Ruins can be heritage. We can get money out of heritage. We can charge insurance. We can like, so yeah. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. It's, it's the negative results of the work of heritage. Probably every um, student coming up as a physicist or a chemist is going to be learning about the disaster that was the cold fusion experiments and what goes wrong when, I mean, this always happens, when you have an exciting result, immediately the media calls you. And it's tempting to talk to the media, but what you really should do is go through peer review process and then talk to the media. And, no, and I definitely bring that paradigm in a way, the way we think of failure and heritage is destruction. If I said, think of failure and heritage, you're like, ISIS by my arm, right? So we don't think of failure as limbo, nothingness, no value articulated despite attempts, which is fine, not everything has to be preserved, right? But that's a good way of making that power. Thank you. Just one more thing. <laughs> one more thing. Um, uh, I was actually involved 
involved in the decommissioning of the research uh, nuclear reactor at Cornell, and there were so many emotions involved with that because there were so many important experiments that had been done at the at that reactor, and I actually had written a letter in favor of saving the reactor because neutron activation analysis, neutron autobiography, they were used to study paintings, they used to study yeah. the store of ceramics, a lot of that was developed at Cornell. And, but ultimately science has moved on. And so there were much safer ways to get at imaging paintings and studying ceramics. Yeah. And, but I hope that they eventually decide to, to preserve that reactor so it can show a point in time when this was such an optimistic and exciting way. Yeah, research. absolutely. And there's our research group, an international kind of network of the, um, called Nuclear Legacies, mm -hmm. and they do like a conference every year. You should join. Uh, mm -hmm. And that uh, that addresses this complicated thing that is now our legacy, especially since the Anthropocene now has been tagged as like having begun in 1945. So it becomes the indicators of our new era and our new experience as humans, right? So it's starting to gain a little bit of momentum, but with a lot of issues. But I should say, there's a lot of there's art exhibitions on decommissioned nuclear reactors in Sweden. If you email me, I'll send you all the stuff. So I'm going to look at that. Yeah, it's really cool stuff. Yes. Thanks. Uh, just Jennifer's first question raised also um, a, a possible uh, sort of social or, I don't know, de demographic threshold that um, history needs to cross to become heritage, by which I mean, does it need to be interesting and important to enough people, and yeah. maybe the right yeah. kind of people, so that while scientists allied with a certain kind of project might be invested in the preservation of this kind of site, yeah. now in this case they seem not to be, which is itself an interesting question. Yes, and maybe that has to do with its, you know, the failure and the, the non, you know, kind of uh, embrace of failure. But it does is is there a moment? Is there a scale of social buy-in of identification? that's also not <coughs> met in this case, um, that pushes um, you know, hi history in a kind of neutral sense of the past uh, into heritage. So the first thing I noticed when I started working here, and I was familiar with this site before because, because I'm from there, um, and I also grew up in, in the nuclear physics campus, and I'd never been to the island, right? So there's an order ethnographic element that constructs, or that validates the fact that this has been abandoned for a really long time, so my, my depth of anecdotal um, data points is quite deep, right? 38 years deep. Um, but the first thing that I notice now that I look at it as an intellectual subject of study is, first of all, simple things. The website of the formation of the National Commission of Atomic Energy of Argentina starts a decade later than this. So they don't mention this at all, which you would think is a really formative moment. So in doing that, you completely eradicate all of the stakeholders that would be the, the, science, the science elite which were already going to be a handful, right? So you've eliminated the possibility of having those stakeholders <coughs> award historical value to this, which would have been the only stakeholders. And then the rest of the st stakeholders, I don't like the word stakeholder, but you know, for the purposes of understanding the context of people that give it value, um, the rest of the stakeholders get alienated by fear of nuclear anything, um, and fear of buying into the possibility that this is something positive, when the dominant perception in town is that it's negative. So how could you possibly go out on a limb and say, no, this is really great. So yeah, and fear of that, fear of engaging with this very complicated, touchy subject of Nazism in Argentina. So in a way, there's, there's, so, there's so much gatekeeping that happened. I don't even know if you could even figure out who put it in place to lift it. So much gatekeeping that the historical value, in a way, it's completely irrelevant. It's, its history has been erased, because it's not documented in any way. It's quite ahistorical. It's three years old in one period, in one moment, and then it just stops existing anywhere. Except for possibly now that I, I brought it up as a heritage <coughs> subject, and now it has to tie itself back to the history. So does that make sense in terms of the, 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 the people aspect of it, right? The bit that we could study. Yeah, thank you very much. I, of course, I didn't know anything about this. Well, who would know about it? Now everyone. But it, it, you know, and and the sort of the the direction of the talk is a kind of resurrection, right? The inclusion 
of something that had been excluded. But I have to say, it made me think a lot about the opposite, which is to say, the why should we bother? Because most of things that we could call the past are not trackable. In that sense, yours is a kind of case study um, at the top end, at the almost accessibly historical end mm -hmm. of a whole gigantic submerged part of the iceberg that is the past, yeah, right? Yeah. And so it kind of raises the question about what what do you think, anyway? Um, <clears throat> What do you think ought to be the criteria for making the effort at resurrecting? Let's say if, it, if this whole yeah, site I mean, were scraped and there was nothing there, in fact, we could still tell this story. So what is the, what is the value added that making this heritage gives us? Yeah. So I just want to clarify, maybe I wasn't clear on this. Um, I don't think this should be heritage or it should be anything, right? I find it, it's really methodologically almost impossible to deal with a heritage subject without, that through your own work, suddenly turning it into heritage, right? And I wish we could use some other analytical word for it, like a, a thing that behaves, or some people have been eyeing it up, as it is happening right now, as a potential heritage subject. But I feel I'm really implicated in that construction of that value. So at the core, I don't, I'm not advocating at all for this being a heritage site. I just find it interesting that it has had moments where it could have been, and then it didn't. And looking at that failure of heritage making, right? It's so just really hard not to be involved in it right. because- So you're actually thinking of it in terms of understanding the process of heritage. Yes, so I'm much more interested in thinking of it as, how are things made to behave heritage? Right? What are the practices? And I agree with you, even if things don't exist, um, and Heritage Studies doesn't like to say this, Heritage Discourse says you need the stuff for it to exist. Otherwise, why would we bother donating to any campaigns to safeguard heritage, mm -hmm. right? The connection between history and the thing of history is really strongly made in Heritage Discourse. I also don't agree with the connection because like you said, you could erase things and they would still happen. Here, there wouldn't be that much left if you erase the site because I have 10 photos, that book, which could be fiction, it sounds like fiction. Um, people are dying off. Every year I go back, I'm like, oh, what do I do? You know, we die, right? So I'm at that cusp of losing all my potential informants. The, the information I get given, I have no idea if it's true or not, because it's rumor, no one really wants to back it up with anything. So it is a bit, a bit of a weird instance in which it could technically be erased if it wasn't for my work, which is a really huge conundrum. I don't want my work to be the thing that makes it heritage. Well, it looks yeah. like, too, you've discovered this connection with, you know, modern science and, like, institutes in the area that are very much connected to this history. And right. if erase, I guess the question is, if we just erase this, is that okay? <laughs> well, I mean, I, it's horrible to go on video saying this. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of preservationist that things, things should be preserved if that makes sense. So I'm not the best person to advocate for the preservation of this site. I find it really fascinating as um, not that different as the way that I looked at the years following the 2004 tsunami in Indonesia and I watched things crumble in front of my eyes and I wasn't hugging buildings. I was just looking at how people were selecting which things to promote as heritage and which ones weren't, right? So. It, it's a bit of a weird participant observation in that you have to um, distance yourself from your preconceived ideas of what should be heritage or not. But the same way that I worked in Indonesia trying to understand heritage value, and the minute you say heritage, people are like, oh yeah, Borobudur, la la la, these are the monumental things. It's really hard to, part of, part of the thing that makes heritage shoot itself in the foot is that there's no other word to talk about the complex construction of values in contemporary times, drawing from selective veins and the discussions from the past. Because we use the word heritage, and instantly heritage is like, oh, heritage, right? So yeah, I'm, I haven't figured out how to manage that um, when it comes to, to promoting this method, because it's ethically complicated. I'm fascinated by this moment when it did become uh, tourism destination. 
And I wondered if you could talk more about where that impulse came from, if you could <coughs> explain yeah. that and why it stopped. Right, it stopped because of logistical issues. So Argentina, so the Switzerland of Argentina is a third world Switzerland of Argentina, right? So it has uh, a very complicated relationship with its own economical cycles. And people, it's the kind of place that I think is a magnet for entrepreneurial thinking, but perhaps I want to say half-baked entrepreneurial thinking. So somebody said, oh, a thing we haven't exploited yet. And a new thing, right? It's like a new attraction. So the municipality every now and then is like, oh, we have this island, it belongs to us. Because strangely, the island is not part of the national park. There's no one it as a national park. The national park reaches up until the water touches the mm -hmm. island, and the island itself is municipal land, which is really crazy, right? So the municipality said, oh, let's just open up a, a what's it called, like a call for proposals. Um, these people came forward, they said, oh, we're going to do a cafe here, then we're going to have this boat that brings people in, and we're going to do this interpretation. No one knows who did the interpretation, um, and we're going to tell people about this really exciting period in history. God knows what they were saying, right? Because maybe they were tapping into the Nazi thing. I don't know, like, because there's very little record of the period as well. Um, so that, that lasted just a few months. And then logistics is a, it's a huge issue in the particular climate of this town. The lake is really dangerous because of its temperature. And so you need a certain size of catamaran to disembark in the island. You need a certain size of pier to be able to disembark people safely, then it becomes, um, the story in a sense is quite boring <laughs> with, when it comes to the failure of that. But there was that investment put in. What's more alarming is that it wasn't regulated and that whenever I sit down with people and I look at the old maps of the island that I've managed to uncover from that period, because then they did do a little bit of mapping. And I say, did you realize, uh, I, you know, I took it like the mayor, do you realize that you guys build this thing on top of this other, you know, 1950s photographic lab that would have been really great. And they're like, no, it's impossible. I'm like, look at the ru like, look at the ruins. <laughs> like, you can see them under that. So um, the concern is that it, it happened in a very predatory way because we just need to create a sexy site. Mm -hmm. And it needs to have a club on this particular location so people would go clubbing <laughs> in this. So I'm not making my country look very good. Now. <laughs> but yes, so. Um, it's a bit, and then the person ran away with all the money, so I tracked him down in another province, and I could have a conversation on the phone. That was very confrontational, where I wanted to get, I wanted to build a stratigraphy of the bits that they did, because it's really hard to date. Like, was this wall built in the 50s, or was it built in 1991? It, things age at a rate there that you can't really tell. So I needed to access the person that made the decisions to construct something, and I'm going by his memory of the few months of construction they did there. Um, so it's another dead end, you know, right? Yeah. So it wasn't like pro-federal and anti-federal? It must, it, has to, it had to have been in a window yeah. where it was pro-federal. <laughs> okay. No, no, sorry. It's complicated. It depends on how they created the narrative. Because okay, okay, it's okay. made the brown government look bad. So our current government, which is not Peronista, would be the current municipality is okay with exploiting the island because they can they think they can manage the negative press, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Um, I thought a couple of points you made are really interesting and ones that are sort of pushed out of heritage discourse mm -hmm. in some ways. I was conservator, so I'm talking from the yeah, yeah. people who like <coughs> do the hands-on work. But thinking that in some way that heritage can be dissociated from politics is one and one thing that's come up a lot recently, and not just in archaeology, is how do how does the museum world, how does the academic world, how do we deal with conspiracy theories, and how does yeah, how yeah. do we uh, maintain authority over narratives? You know, mm -hmm. but the, even the, even the use of the word narrative to mean yeah. stories other than those that are sanctioned by the whole and I just think that those are there's, those are two really interesting sort of maybe tangential to your primary. No, but I think that's really, that's a good point. I mean, politics here either gives us access or denies us access to the site. Um, and we so we purport to make nature. plans for our heritage in the long term, yeah. as though there's no contingency for political. I mean, we're, within conservation right now, we're talking about uh, taking down Confederate monuments. But if, right. how, how does conservation right. right. interface with this? Because some yeah. physical, actual, someone needs to go and actually dismantle those things. Or the um, 
Teddy Roosevelt statue at National History was just yeah, I just spray painted. Yeah. So will we conserve it? So I'm pretty sure if these ruins have been in an urban space where you can build, it they wouldn't be here. I don't I don't think there would have been any pushback to tearing them down. Maybe now because of me. Well, there would be some kind of pushback, but even if they weren't on the island but close to the town, they would have just taken all the pieces of the walls for construction. Yeah, there would have been something. Communities. And I'm pretty sure that if I found a method to do this, I could find a lot of the pieces of the island in people's living rooms. Not the not the expensive experiment, not the copper piping that was used for the chemical labs. Because I know that that was reincorporated and a lot of the work I'm doing now is going lab by lab by lab in this huge nuclear physics institute and finding bits. This, 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 right? But um, but otherwise it's, it exists elsewhere. But yeah, the, the political aspect is quite interesting because um, because obviously there's still, they, want me, they wanted me to make a comment on the state of conservation. But what's the state of conservation? I'm like, but for what? Like, what did it look like? I don't know what you wanted to look at. It looks safe, but you need a structural engineer. These are huge structures. And I've never done chemical analysis on the soil. I'm pretty sure there's toxins in places I stay on the path, right? Because who knows what they were mobilizing there? And that's one of the, actually I've been consulting with a conservator down there, or someone doing a PhD and trying to lure her into, could you do some kind of toxin analysis of different areas of the site to make, to not take it as face value that these tourist development guys decided that it was safe to move around this forest. So, yeah. Um, well, it's, 115, so we will stop here, but I think Trinidad will be around for more, com for more questions. Yeah. You guys have more questions to keep talking, so thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much for the great question.